There's no question that since 2017, the conversation around UFOs, UAPs, non-human intelligence, and disclosure has gone haywire. It started with the groundbreaking Leslie Keen, Ralph Blumenthal article in the New York Times entitled Glowing Auras, Black Money, the Pentagon's Secret UFO Program. Then we got the now infamous gimbal, go fast, tic tac videos. We had To the Stars Academy, Lou Elizondo, David Grush, congressional hearings, the Schumer Amendment, the Soul Foundation. And at this point, it seems like something new and exciting is happening almost every week. The question is, how do you stay on top of it all and how do you get good quality information with so much going on? If you spend any amount of time online, eventually you realize that one of the biggest repositories of UFO information anywhere on the internet is actually Reddit. And on Reddit, the UFOB subreddit is one of the best places you can go to have conversations about all this stuff and stay up to date. UFOB is short for Unidentified Flying Objects, and it's a smaller subreddit, just under 100,000 members right now, started by a group of moderators who take this issue very seriously, and they wanted a place to have a frank, honest, and open conversation without a lot of the bullshit that you find in some of the other subreddits. It's where I go, and it's where I do a lot of research for this show. If you haven't already seen it, you should go back and watch my interview with Pix or It Didn't Happen. He's one of the mods of UFOB. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with another mod from UFOB who goes by the screen name Remzy2907. We had a great conversation about the subreddit. We talked about Remzi's personal experiences that brought him into the fold and led him to start this journey. He also runs the UFOB YouTube channel, which is a great place to go for UFO-related documentaries, clips, and information and videos on the subject. I hope you enjoy the interview. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. It really does help. Don't forget to like and share this video. Thank you for watching. Now enjoy the interview. What what kind of work do you do when you're not doing UFO yeah. stuff? <laughs> well, I'm a politician. Really? Yeah, a local politician. So um, that's what I work in. Um, and that's difficult because, uh, you know, um, I'm in a chat also with on WhatsApp with these people. And sometimes I tell about it and it's like, okay, no, this is, has nothing to do with local politics. And I'm like, yeah, but it could become very important because these things fly over our heads, <laughs> no matter the border, you know? So, um, yeah, but it's nice. And I did a lot of things uh, for my town, good things and uh, people like it. So and that, that's my motivation also, you know. Do yeah. you find that uh, generally your UFO research world is separated from the everyday people that you talk to? Yeah. Nine to five. I mean, yes, or is, it, is there any crossover at all? Well, um, I de I decided at one point, like, okay, I'm honest about it. I speak about it. Um, if they call me crazy, so be it. You know, it's a choice you make. And there are people who are very uh, afraid of, of it. But why? Because if everybody is like that, uh, you're not progressing any uh, in any way. So um, now, for me, this works best, to be honest, and uh, speak about my experiences because, um, yeah, some things happened to me which were incredible, really incredible. And um, um, it was in the 90s, and the 90s was, was a crazy period for me, personally, like almost magical, totally different than today. And uh, because, you know, I look up a lot and never see anything, never. But the things that happened here between 94 and 97 were, were crazy, really. And, um, but of course, also in the 70s, but that I didn't, uh, you know, I'm almost 49. I'm a 49, almost 50. So um, the 70s were not my, uh, I, I wasn't that conscious in that time. <laughs> yeah. I I think you make a really great point about making a conscious choice to talk about it and, and yes. it's just accept it as a part of reality. And I think many people, including myself too, I, I had to really struggle with that when I started doing this on uh -huh. YouTube. Yeah. And because um, I have a professional life separate from this and I try uh -huh. not to mix the two. Uh -huh. But I think 
it's important to normalize the conversation. And the only way you can do that is by talking about it absolutely. and not being afraid of what people think, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's also um, a matter of trust. M many people say, okay, uh, your story, uh, is it trust me, bro? And then I say, yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. It's trust me, bro, because I'm telling a story and I'm not doing this for fun. I'm not doing this for fame. Uh, you have to trust me at some point. And that's when it comes down to how we interact as human beings, you know? We have to trust each other. Um, of course, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people lying or creating stories. Uh, that happens too. But um, at some point you have to trust somebody. And that's- Well, let I me ask you, important. let me ask you this. Uh, and then uh, first I want to ask you this question uh -huh. and then we'll go into your background. Uh -huh. If you were talking to someone who's fresh to this subject uh -huh. and you had to, and they asked you, tell me what's going on. Like what, describe, like what is the situation right now in 2024? Yeah. What would you tell them? I would tell them that uh, UFOs, uh, it's, it's a subject, I see it like this. There are different realities parallel to each other. For instance, if you're not interested in this subject, you will never hear about it. You will never see it on the media. Every now and then you see it, but people say, oh, okay, not my piece of uh, cake, okay. But these, the moment you're going to uh, uh, invest time in it, you know, and the moment you uh, put effort in it, you'll notice wow, this is real, this is happening, it's incredible. And that's the strange thing about this subject. There are two parallel realities. And eventually they will merge together. Because you see now these two realities are bumping into each other every now and then, especially now with politics in the, in the US especially. That's what I like about the US, because the people there are so much... Uh, more open to this subject uh, instead of uh, in relation to Europeans. Um, it's starting to happen now because in the Euro Parliament people are waking up. Uh, but in the America they are much further in this process. And that's also worrying. Worrying. Um, so what I tell people is, okay, this subject is increasingly becoming more important. But the dilemma here is that people don't see it every day. Eh? Every now and then people see a light in the sky or something. So, um, but it's mainly military. You see these, uh, these objects are mainly harassing uh, military bases. And that's strange because there is a, an interest from this uh, phenomenon in the military uh, bases. Uh, also on the oceans, around the oceans, um, ships, Navy ships. And that's strange because you would expect from, a, from a, an extraterrestrial or interdimensional phenomenon that it's, that it's interested in us and in our culture and how we think, etc. Not in our military capabilities. And that's what I find worrying in a sense. Mm. Because, uh, okay, uh, perhaps they worry about us destroying each other. Yeah, that's a possibility. I can imagine, I mean, they uh, deactivate nuclear weapons and they even activated one, f several, in, in the US and uh, in the Ukraine. Um, that's something uh, that's not discussed a lot, but uh, it happened. Absolutely sure of it. So, um, yeah, uh, to someone who isn't familiar with this subject, I would say that, okay, learn about it because sooner or later this will be on your plate. <laughs> and that's what I tell people because the ontological shock, as they say, uh, the shock, uh, it's, it's a paradigm shift. It's called a paradigm shift, not for nothing. Yeah. And... Um, 
That's why I created uh, the YouTube channel to give people uh, uh, a possibility to learn about the history uh, based on their own interest. Because if you're not interested in cattle mutilations, skip the playlist. Yeah. Hmm. If you're interested in the, in the pilots, look at the playlist. It's all there. Uh, based of uh, separated on, by year and uh, subject so you can get the information you like you prefer yeah do you think based on what you see and in your own study mm -hmm. that there is an increase in activity right now that that we're seeing a ramp up in activity or are we just seeing more activity because we're looking for it now and more people are looking for it that's a good question, and it's also a difficult question, because only the military would know if there is an, in, uh, an increasing, uh, uh, if, there is, if it's increasing. I, I do think that, um, that it's now focusing, the phenomenon is focusing mainly on the military targets. And they used to focus on the, on the civilians, you know, on the people, um, like abductions, I, you can believe in it or not. But there is something happening, and especially in the 90s, there were a lot of people saying they were abducted. And now, today, you don't hear it as much. Maybe it still happens, but you don't hear it as much. So it's like they are performing certain operations, like, okay, uh, this was the era of the abductions. Okay, we did that. This is the era of military uh, uh, interaction. Okay. We did that. You know, it's like stages. Mm -hmm. But what is it leading to? That's the whole question. Um, I don't believe that they are, they want this planet. Uh, I think that's too easy to say that. But they have their own interests in this, in this planet. And what it is, I can only guess. Yeah. Do you think that um, the moment that we're in right now, I, I kind of think of, Mm -hmm. The history of UFO or ufology mm -hmm. as everything in ancient past up to Roswell, then Roswell until 2017 is like its own separate phase. And then 2017, it seems like things really took off and mm, started yes. to accelerate. Do you think yeah. we're moving towards some kind of a, a climax where are we yes. going to be alive to see the day where there's contact or is something coming that is going to change our day-to-day -day lives in a really measurable, noticeable way? I think that um, what we see happening now in the United States is amazing with the UAP caucus, you know. Um, Congress people uh, are waking up, um, they are talking to each other. Um, they are like uh, Congressman Burleson, you know, uh, they are now creating, uh, what's it called? Uh, well, I forgot what it was exactly, but they signed uh, for uh, creating a new office or something. And um, yeah, so so we're I think we're we're, we're heading some somewhere. Yeah, and uh, the Pentagon is now clutching at straws. You know, like okay, what <laughs> what do we, they are panicking? It's clearly true, and uh, that's what we see happening now. And um, that's why they created this Arrow report, which. Yeah, it's a piece of toilet paper in my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> and um, but it works for the people who don't, uh, who are generally um, not interested in this topic because that's the price to win, the opinion of the public. You have the uh, the community on one side who want uh, to influence the public opinion, and on the other side you have the Pentagon. Uh, who wants to keep it all the way it is, you know? So it's interesting to, to see how that develops. But I think, I think we're actually getting somewhere because if you compare this time with uh, uh, pre-2017, it's totally different. We've had hearings. Well, we didn't have so many hearings before there to, uh, that. So um, in the past, I believe we had one hearing in the past, one or two. So, um, yeah, I think we're actually getting somewhere. Yeah. And Do you get I the think, sense that... Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, perhaps 10 years from now. But I don't think it will lead to contact. 
I don't think so, because this phenomenon has its own will, its own agenda. And, um, but um, what's the admiral called? Um, Gallaudet, Admiral uh, Gallaudet. He said uh, there, is con there had been contact. So it is possible that it happened in the past, but what it is and how, I don't know. We'll have to hear later about it because I think it's, class it's still classified. Yeah? That's the thing. I mean, it's the na national security implications. There, uh, it's difficult because it, this uh, phenomenon has the classification higher than the H bomb. Do you get the sense that something is uh, accelerating this conversation? We've heard conversations about um, there's some kind of an event that might happen or something that could be coming uh, in 2027 or 2030. I've heard different dates kicked around. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think there's something going on? Well, the strange thing is that you hear mainly from the ex-CIA people um, about 2027, 20, you know? Um, is that information of it or is it misinformation? And if it is misinformation, why? Why talk about an event? Because if that event never happens in 2027, everybody will be like, ah, you see, it's all nonsense. And maybe they drop the interest altogether. You know, you don't know what's behind it. And um, Jim Semifan, I think Jim Semifan is, is quite an honest guy because um, um, he said it, that it's very serious things happened to people. Um, so I, th I think that he, when I look him in the eye, I think, okay, yes, it could be true what he's saying. I think aspects of this phenomenon um, are malevolent. That doesn't mean that it's all malevolent, of course. Some certain aspects, I think, are uh, malevolent. And that's when we come to Louis Elizondo, because Louis Elizondo um, spoke to people in government who told him, drop it. And El Louis Elizondo said, why? Well, because this is demonic. Did you read your Bible? Mm. And this, and then he was like, okay, but shouldn't we study it then at least? Or how, how can we decide if this is demonic or not? How can you independently decide that? I mean, when you find a wreckage at Roswell uh, and you see bodies, you, d you cannot uh, discern uh, or decide for yourself, okay, this is demonic. Was there a little paper? Where, hello, we are demons? No, you know what I mean? So it's difficult, I think. And um, maybe certain people are convinced this is a demonic phenomenon. And then we're entering a totally different uh, uh, discussion because um, there are a lot of people who think it is and that they are like parasitic, you know, parasitic uh, entities who need our energy and that they are creating division in our society so that they get more uh, food. Yeah, <laughs> that's in essence what it comes down to. And I'm, I'm uh, open to any possibility. So I try to look at it in a agnostic way, you know, like, okay, mm -hmm. it could be. And, and if it's demonic, uh, then what? But if it's ET, then what? If it's interdimensional, then what? So that's uh, yeah. something uh, I'm, I try to, um, to look at all the aspects of the phenomenon. I think that's a, a yeah. particularly, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, but I think it's a particularly American uh, mindset that uh, the American military tradition tends to be very conservative and a lot of the conservative type mm -hmm. folks who wind up in the military and, and yeah. spend their life and their career in it tend to come from that um, a, a Christian mindset, a Christian background, and that, that's their upbringing. And so their, their perspective is colored by that. And that's the vocabulary okay. that they bring to the conversation. And so because so few people are allowed to look at this subject, 
I think we have a very small minority of decision makers that no one else elected, no one chose. We don't know who they are. We don't know how many there are. And they're making decisions that affect all of us. And I think yes. that's, that's frightening in, yes. in, in, for, for many reasons. But it definitely seems like uh, this conversation about demons and angels and all this stuff, it, I think yeah. it muddies the waters and it makes it very confusing for a lot of people to, yes. uh, to get involved. Do you think that we're dealing with one phenomena or is this a, a, a number of different things? In other words, is this one super intelligence that's manifesting in different ways or are we dealing with, say, 20, 30, 40 different alien species that are coming here and going for their own reasons and they have independent motivations? What do you think is going on there? Well, I see it like this. You know, when human beings uh, go into space and we colonize planets, imagine. Um, sooner or later, groups will be forgotten, you know, because they travel into space and there is no oversight who's where. And in the end, there will be maybe millions of groups of human beings in space. Um, and I think that's happened already. So. You know, we think we are uh, the species in the universe and the universe is waiting for us. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think uh, the universe has already been colonized. So, um, and I think that the species that come here, we see a lot of types of great people, people I say, but great beings in the, in, in people see them or people talk about them. And they can be long, they can be short, uh, they have bigger heads, smaller heads. Uh, but in the end, um, the black eyes are something that always comes back in these stories. So it's possible that they colonized the universe, or at least the Milky Way. And um, yeah, that the groups that are coming here have their own interest. So. The thing is, when a UFO lands and a grey comes out, uh, in one uh, 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 instance you can shake a hand, in the other you uh, you get the ray, you know what I mean? <laughs> you don't know how, how they will respond. So that's the difficult thing about UFO. UFO. The best thing is to run away, I think. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially um, if you read... Uh uh, Bud Hopkins and, and yes, Dave Jacobs' yes. books that yeah. went away. Yeah, but look yeah, at I, uh, Ari Ariel School event was not malevolent, you know. So uh, I think that was a, a benevolent um, case or a benevolent uh, uh, sighting. So it, it it's it's both, I think. But the thing is, we don't know how, and maybe they have uh, like. Um, uh, there's this thing in uh, Star Star um, Wars, and then Star Trek, the um, Prime Directive. You know, you cannot uh, interfere with uh, primitive uh, societies. You can study it, but you cannot interfere. I think that's happening. So we see a lot of beings, a lot of from maybe from interdimensional with an interdimensional uh, background or from uh, planets, ET, but they cannot interfere with us. Uh, I think that's the case, but that's an assumption. But don't you think that they seem to be interfering all the time anytime they turn off our nuclear weapons yeah. or switch off an aircraft carrier or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, interfere yeah. with military training exercises? I mean, they interfere... That's the mm -hmm. thing. I, 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 I hear that a lot, and it seems to me that they don't really care either way. There's a physicist. Um, his name is, he's a Belgian physicist. His name is Auguste Mason. Great guy, because I uh, studied his, his work. Um, he's from the University of Louvain in Belgium, and he did a lot of work for the Belgian wave, uh, scientific work. And um, what, what was the question you asked, sorry? Oh, uh, about interference in day-to-day in -day human activities. They seem uh -huh. to be interfering a lot. Yes, that's what he said. He said they're giving us hints. 
And um, so, and these hints uh, guide us towards some end game. And what that is, I don't know. But um, for instance, the military is conscious of the fact that um, that they that they disable nuclear weapons. Period. They know that they don't like. And probably they don't like it in space as well, because they say that the Russians are planning nuclear weapons in space. Well, good luck, I would say, <laughs> because I don't think they accept it. But that's my personal opinion. I don't think they accept it. And um, yeah, that's what, what we're seeing. And that's also happening in Ukraine. There's a lot of UFO ac activity in Ukraine, also recently. With the, with the war, so they are absolutely monitoring us. Yeah, it's absolutely true. So, um, but it's it's possible they give us hints, uh, like like a little guidance. Maybe they don't want us ourselves to blow to blow ourselves up. You know, it's possible. It seems like a display of power to me, right? Like, what's more impressive than dropping an atomic bomb on somebody or using a nuclear weapon, right? Yeah. Just being able to switch it off. Like in the movies, when you see somebody pulls out a gun and then the other guy just takes the gun away. It seems like there's a very big divide online between what people call the Love and Light Brigade and then the, uh, I don't want to call it UFO doomers, but the people who are a little bit more nervous about what might be going on. Mm -hmm. Do you find that or, or do you think it's more of a spectrum? I think it's a spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because there, there can be malevolence, there can be benevolence, and um, they all have their own agendas. So, what is your own personal background with the subject? How did you become uh, so involved in it? I had a, a few experiences between uh, the year 1994 and the year 1997. Um, you know, and that's what I, I gave a, an interview uh, for a Dutch channel in Dutch. And I started with, okay, you know, people already raise an eyebrow when you have one UFO experience. But when you tell them four, generally it's like, okay, <laughs> case closed. <laughs> um, but you have to remember that uh, there was a the Belgian there was a Belgian wave in the 90s early 90s and my personal theory is that it shifted north to the Netherlands after the Belgian wave um, because I had four experiences and two with people uh, with me so um, I'm happy that I wasn't the only one and um, the first one was in 1994. And I can tell you uh, about the experiences. Um, I live in a town about 30 minutes north of Amsterdam. And my parents were divorced. Um, so uh, my mother worked very hard eh, for, for the household, etc. Et she was never there. But then when she was there at night, in the evening, we always sat together in the garden and spoke about things and the universe because my mother and, and I and we are interested in these things. So um, we were sitting in the garden and we were discussing my birthday because I would be, uh, uh, it, was, it would have been my birthday in a few weeks. So um, we were on the chairs and I was showing my mother the, 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 the stars and we put our chairs together at the back, you know, and like we're watching the sky and suddenly I noticed uh, a light coming towards us. And, but it was like, it was not moving like in at one speed, but it was like, as if it was uh, monitoring everything, you know, watching and, and it stopped above our heads suddenly. And the thing is, I said to my mother, do you see it? Do you see it? And she said, yes, yes, because what can you say at such, in such a moment? And the thing, it, it made a, a swipe to the left, to the right, to the middle, back to the middle eh, where it came from. And it left uh, as if it was going the same track. So we were completely baffled, like, what's this, you know? 
And it was it was not the typical UFO because normally you expect, of course, a saucer, but it was not really a saucer. It was, I couldn't even see the shape because it was so fast. And but the sudden movement, it's the the, the ninety degree turns, and the, the the sudden stop and the sudden acceleration was incredible. And um, well, recently I interviewed my mother. I don't know if you can show the the clip. It was 1994, it was yes. the 3rd of July, and yes. you uh, were in the garden, and yes. it was uh, around 12 o'clock, I think, that I arrived home, because a friend brought me home, and it was a beautiful summer's evening, it was warm, yes. It was there was a clear sky, yes. no wind, and uh, well, you were sitting in the garden, and I said, oh, let me join you, and we sat together. Um, yes. it, we were talking about the stars later on. We were looking at the stars, and then yes. I think it was twelve o'clock. Uh, so. Suddenly occurred uh, in the sky with an incredible speed you can't uh, you can't imagine. So very, very, very speedy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was uh, it had the shape of a cigar. Mm -hmm. Uh, it came, it stopped in the air. How did it, it stop? How did it stop? Suddenly. Yeah. From uh, thousands of kilometers, uh, miles an hour, it stopped suddenly. It went to the left. Mm -hmm. It went back to where it... Uh, came, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then it went to the right, mm -hmm. and it went back, and it followed his way, yes. the same way. Yeah. So it looked like a cross. Our hearts went uh, <laughs> terrible. We were sitting in the in this chair, and we couldn't say a word. This is unbelievable, yeah. but it happened. It happened. And uh, the first thing I said to you was, don't ever mention it, what we saw, because people were laughing at us and say we are crazy. <clears throat> and I'm happy I've had that experience with you, my son, so we can always talk about it when we are together. And you know, What was your reaction when you saw it? What did you think? We knew, we knew immediately how, and how who old it was. How I was old 19. were you? 19. You were 19, okay. Yeah. So, um, but you're not, you know, UFOs are not uh, what you're thinking of when you're 19 years old. <laughs> no, let's be honest. Um, but this was, I, we, we immediately knew what this was. And that's the nice thing about it. It's, it's, in fact, we saw one of the five observables. We saw, oh, well, maybe several. We saw instant acceleration or instant speed. Uh, we saw a sudden stop. So it was, it was incredible, and um, but no sound. That's strange, you know. Total absence of sound, and the th I have the idea that there was a little glow around the object, and um, but it went so fast, and uh, but that this is how it started, and um, so the next day. Um, a friend came over and uh, he was a, a house a friend who came uh, to, to our house a lot and he had problems with his relationship so um, my mother spoke to him and of course we discussed what we uh, what happened and he was laughing couldn't handle it and I was angry and uh, and I went upstairs to my room and I was like, fuck him, you know. <laughs> and um, I looked outside of the window and there was this, uh, as, as if somebody was with a mirror shining in your eye, you know that, in this, with the sun? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was very reflective, extremely reflective, um, like greenish, silverish. And I was like, okay, what's that? Is it uh, an airplane? Because... 
I was thinking like if I'm yelling downstairs now, like I'm seeing something strange, come, and it appears to be an airplane. This guy doesn't believe me at all, you know? So I watched it and there was a little cloud and this object went behind the cloud, but it was a single cloud. So I kept my eyes on the cloud. It never came from between, from behind it. And that's strange because when it's an airplane, you know, it has to come from behind the cloud. It never did. And for me, that was very strange because I was like, I was thinking like, well, how is this possible? How is this possible? Um, because how could they know that I was discussing it, you know, or yeah, it's, it's strange. Maybe it's co uh, just a coincidence. But it felt like, hello, we're here and we're showing you it was real. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that is necessarily the case, but that's the idea I got. And um, so they were there in the area doing things. And the, uh, uh, there was a, a nuclear reactor in our area who had leaks at that m moment. And there was an earthquake also. <laughs> Imagine that in the same week. So, um, yeah, maybe they were drawn to that. It's a possibility because the reactor, they make a medi medication there and this reactor was, uh, wasn't was safe. There were cracks and it was a scandal also. So um, perhaps that's uh, what, what they were drawn to, but it's very close by. So, um, but it was strange. It was a daylight sighting. And I cannot explain it because an airplane is air buoyant and has to move. And when, an, when it is above a cloud, it has to come be from behind the cloud. So, but I didn't say it, of course, to the guy downstairs, but later I told my mother. So uh, that was the second, second ex experience. And I think that was the same um, object or... Uh, the same area they were monitoring or something. But uh, it was 1994 and it was ju early July and the, the Ariel school case was two months later in September. Mm. So there was definitely something going on. And uh, then uh, the third experience was in 95. And that was for me personally, the most scary, scary one, because a friend came over um, and he asked me to bring him to the bus station. But you know, in Holland, we all drive, uh, ride a bike. <laughs> so he was sitting on the back of the, of the bike and uh, I brought him to the station and I went back to, ha to my house. And, um, I was looking at the stars and I was cycling and I was like, wow, beautiful sky, a few clouds and a full moon. And from one moment to the other, I looked at an enormous round disc exactly above me, but it wasn't hanging still. It was moving in a one straight line. But the moment I looked up, it was exactly above me and it was pitch black. There was no lights, nothing, pitch black. And I was like, okay, I knew immediately this is a UFO, point. I pulled my brakes and I kept my eyes on it. And I, it went in front of the, uh, the, the moonlight, you know, of the full moon. And I saw, the, 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 from, saw it from the side. So, and I realized that it was quite thick also, quite, yeah, so it was a, uh, this shape, but it was enormous. I estimated about 30 meters across, but it's difficult because um, you don't have a reference, you know, you don't know how high is it. So it's always an estimation. And my intuition says it was about 30 meters. So that would be 90 feet about. Um, it went over my head, it, it never stopped. So it went a straight line and I saw it disappear in the distance and I saw it pass in front of the moonlight. So I saw it contrast and it was, it was big and it was a typical saucer. Yeah, I can't make it otherwise. And um, 
it, it had no lights. So what people always w- was it completely bl- was it black, black or was it just black. metallic black? No, blacker than black. So it's almost as if light is not reflected by it. So it's I call it a camouflage mode. Um, if I never looked up, I would never have seen it. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. it, because you don't hear it. And it's, uh, it, it was a very, it was even a little bit traumatic for me. Not in the sense that, um, that I cannot cope with seeing, seeing a UFO, seeing such an object, but I was totally alone. I couldn't share it with anybody. But I did think at that moment, like, okay, you sneaky bastards, you know, um, flying around without us knowing and on camouf- in a camouflage mode also. Mm. Because otherwise, you, they could have put on the, the light show, but they didn't. But did you feel like you had a um, impulse to look up when you did? Yeah. Was it, were yeah. you like you did? Yeah. Did that come from outside? Do you think, or you, were you just looking up and there it was? Well, when I when I sit on the bike, I always look up because I love the stars. I love the, the universe. Uh, I'm also a very scientific person, so I read a lot about it, and. Um, but it, I always think it's strange that the moment I look up, this, this thing is there. And, um, yeah, it was a magical, magical experience. And also, you, you know, how some, some experiencers, uh, describe like they hear this, like it's almost like a thought comes into their mind, like look over there and they look and there it is. Like, did you have mm-hmm. that? No, no, I didn't have a, a message or something. Um, but I had, I did feel the urge to look up. So maybe maybe it's the same, but I interpreted it in a different way. You know, like I was accidentally looking up. But it was a strange, very strange experience. And 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 also, people say to me, oh, "How do you know this is not human technology?" Well, I never saw this in my life, even today. And it's so it was so elegant in the way it moved. It's it's almost like um, when you throw a stone over the water, you know, it skips over the water like that. So easy. So um, yeah, and that's it's, it's technology this, which is far more advanced. And um, yeah, but the, the why and column camouflage mode? Yeah, I don't know. But they were there. It makes you wonder how many, like even as we sit here right now how many hundreds or thousands of these ships could be all around in the atmosphere and orbit. Yes. Uh, it, it's almost yes. impossible to, to calculate. Yes. And Richard Dolan said it once in a podcast. He said, what are they doing at 3 a.m.? <laughs> you know, when everybody is asleep, mm. they hover above your houses. And it's, you know, it's so easy. We're so, such we're sitting ducks in essence. In essence. Um, but it's also as if they don't want to scare us because why, why do you fly on, uh, uh, why, why totally black? Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was, it was a crazy experience. And, uh, that was, t- uh, the only one in which I was totally alone. There were no people around me and there was, and it was, I wonder eerie. if, if you had been on, in a car, if the car would have shut down, you know how we always hear stories about the car turns off. Did you hear? Yeah. Uh, another thing that people commonly describe is that the, all the sound, all the insects, all the birds, everything goes completely quiet. Did you have that experience at all before there you saw was the no, so there I didn't hear anything around me. No, I didn't hear anything around me. So um, normally, you know, the Netherlands is a busy country. There's always sound, like the, uh, a road or people around you. There were no people. It was strange, very strange. But uh, it was 1995. And uh, it was a different period, you know, um, and it was, uh, I believe, on a Monday evening. So people were working the next day. So everybody was asleep. And um, yeah, it was it was. Totally, Did you experience uh, any missing time? I don't know. I don't know. Because when I went, I came home, I told my mother, of course, because uh, she knew, uh, of course, <laughs> because of the first experience we had together. And, um, but I never, 
discussed with her like okay how long was i away i don't know no so and and that's something you know i i would like to go in regression one time just to uh feel it again experience it again i never done it so but i don't know what comes out of it to be honest yeah but um I never forget it. Uh, oh, yeah, if you can sh mm. show the, the animation, maybe, yeah, yeah, hang on. Because this animation doesn't show the fact that it was above me because I couldn't, and I, but how it moved away. So this is what I saw. What you saw, just to be clear, it was a smooth motion. Yes. It was flying in a smooth line. It wasn't like yes. click, click, click. No, because no. some people have described always... that where it looks. Yes. Yeah, but this was a constant in a straight line movement. Wow. So, um, and, and, and even when I looked at it uh, to, on, on its underside, it was moving, mm. you know? And um, yeah, yeah. The next day I had to make an exam for school and I messed it, messed it up. <laughs> I was looking around in my classroom and I was, if you only knew what I had seen yesterday evening. Did you just and go home and then go to sleep normally? And like, or were you up yeah, all night thinking about it? Like, I, oh my I didn't God, I sleep. I didn't sleep. Yeah, of course. And the next day I had to go to school and, uh, and I mm. was in my class and I, we had this exam. And, and that, that was the only exam I messed up. <laughs> uh, I couldn't concentrate. And I, it was so surrealistic, you know, because you look around like, okay, and everybody is acting as sort of being being normal, and and I mm. was like, okay, you're in a total different uh, reality, and you can't you can't go back to old reality. Isn't it strange? I think about yeah. that all the time. How how yeah. it seems like the day to day trivialities of our normal nine to five lives here on earth. And we're just sort of like scrambling to get yeah. through our day and thinking about all the yes. little problems that we have. But meanwhile, there's this enormous reality. That's just, it almost feels like it's, it's right there. It's just outside of yes. reach. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. It's just, it just seems like uh, I, I want to get there. I want to get, mm -hmm. <laughs> like I want to see what's <laughs> yes. on the other side of that hill, you yeah. know? Yeah. And a lot of people say to me, okay, are oh, you lucky? You're lucky. It doesn't always feel that way because, hmm. um, you cannot, you cannot go to old reality. You know, um, you saw it. And when you deny it, you're in essence lying to yourself. So, um, yeah, that's, I, I, uh, I try to give it, uh, I, that's why I started this, this UFO, uh, uh, community because I want to do something with it and um, tell the story. And, um, but you know, normally I never speak about my own experiences. I try to mm. um, uh, show, uh, show people the good cases, uh, you know, the military cases, the, the pilot cases, because I'm just an ordinary citizen. And um, yeah, with a story, of course, an extraordinary story. But people generally want believe the the pilots, you know, because they are professionals. Yeah, that's that's true. That that happens, and um, um, not that I uh, ha don't have the uh, ability to to <laughs> to distinguish a, an airplane with wings from a round object. No, of course not. But um, people generally believe pilots. Mm. Yeah. So, what, how did that shape uh, th this experience and, and your previous experience? How, how did that shape your worldview going forward from that moment? I mean, did, did that change the way that you think about mm -hmm. your day-to-day -day life? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, I know people are so occupied with things that are not important. I, I hear it on the streets. Uh, it's always about money. Uh, about buying things, about material stuff. Um, there's a rea reality which is so much more exciting. And uh, we have to, and that's, uh, I think, a very important message. We have to develop 
Uh, we have to, is that spirituality? I don't know. Uh, but we have to grow, you know, we have to expand. Um, we cannot just stay, uh, sit people who just go to work, uh, eat, sleep, and that's it. There's far, there's much more to life. And, but it's also a, a free choice. People have the free choice to learn, to, um, um yeah about this subject uh or it's it's a difficult yeah it's a difficult one isn't it because i yeah. think um you know choice comes up a lot in this conversation about you know people yes. choose to believe and and it's mm -hmm. but the message has been so muddied over the years and there's so much interference from the government and from different organizations yeah. that are trying to manipulate the message and make it uh seem silly or or uh you know like a danger a risk to your career to even look into it and i don't think people have really had the full for one we don't have all the facts and the facts that we do have we don't even really know what's true and what's not because so much uh -huh. has been tampered with you mentioned uh, this is one of the reasons why you started uh the subreddit uh ufo b can you talk a little bit about that as you as uh -huh. you uh, decided to yeah expand the conversation in, in your own way. What was the inspiration behind that and how did that get started? Uh, the personal experiences, of course. Um, so I know it's real. Um, and I want to, um, and I was like, okay, it's real. Uh, now I have to uh, do my own research. And uh, that's what I did. And it's very difficult to do research because everything is scrambled around. Uh, even today, I hear about cases. I, I'm like, okay. <laughs> How is it possible? I never heard about this case. And um, so there's a lot of, there are a lot of cases and there's so much. It's so incredible that it's just out there in the ether. And we, when you're not interested in the subject, you don't hear about it, you don't see it. And that's so strange. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, why I created um, UFOB because I wanted uh, a com to create a community. I wanted to offer a place where people can discuss it without being ridiculed. Um, and that's why we said, okay, I know personally that this is real. So let's uh, start from there, you know? We say, okay, this is real. That's what uh, Pix said recently on your podcast. Um, that's our starting point, that it's real. And that changes the whole discussion because when you get people like, ah, weather balloon, you know, it's that's not progressing in any way. Of course, sometimes there are cases that are prosaic and sometimes we make a mistake, that happens. But generally, um, we show good cases eh, with, with pilots and stuff. And, uh, but it's unbelievable in my opinion, because sometimes there are pilots who see a UFO, it's recorded on radar. And sometimes there is even another aircraft involved uh, with people who mm. see it. There's a good case called in Argentina, the Barry Lodge case. I don't know if you know it. Mm -mm. Um, there's a pilot, Polanco and the entire, all the people inside the airplane saw the UFO. <laughs> and the thing is, when the pilot decided to change uh, uh, his course, he noticed that the UFO was already anticipating what he wanted to do. So it was like, this craft is reading my mind. It's crazy. Then when he wanted to land on the landing strip, all the lights went out. He couldn't land. Because the power, there was a power outage on the air, on the airfield. Um, finally, in the end, the light went back on, probably because of a generator that started working. And they landed safely. And he went on television everywhere. And it was a great case. It's a great case because it's not just the pilot who sees it, but the entire air, uh, airfield was affected. Uh, the people inside the aircraft saw it. And they all went uh, on television. They what they were interviewed, mm. and that's what I try to do. Also, is to translate these uh, cases and subtitle them into English, so it's easier for people. I recently uh, translated a lot of French cases 
uh, Brazilian cases. It's a lot of work, but it's very nice to do. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's the thing. I, I mean, um, you cannot explain this away uh, like Mick West, you know, prosaic. Ah, mm. it's just this or just that. No, it's impossible. Really impossible. Because a radar glitch is possible with one radar installation. But when you have several radar installations, it's impossible. Mm-hmm. Also, when you have ups, uh, people seeing it. So, yeah, we're fooling ourselves. Recently, we had the Arrow report released that um, was pretty universally panned and, and uh, frowned upon. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? And, and do you have any opinions on on that report? <laughs> Yes. Well, you have to go back in history because um, the Condon report, for instance, I believe it was 1968, um, the Air Force was looking, really looking for a university to create a report, uh, uh, for a university to help them creating a report in which the outcome was already known. (laughs) And they found this university. It was the University of Colorado. And the man, Edward Condon, uh, was the physicist, a good one also. But um, they probably spoke with him like, okay, Edward, we need you to help us because this is a subject that can cause panic and uh, we need uh, to to play it down. And that's essentially what, uh, what, you, what, you, what we want you to do. So um, Richard Dolan made a beautiful uh, episode on it uh, about James McDonald, and he speaks about the Condon report also. And he said that Condon even got a mild heart attack because of the stress involved in this report. Imagine. And he fired the crew uh, and replaced it, totally replaced it, because the crew noticed oh, this is real. <laughs> so what he had to do is, okay, replace them. And... Um, Finally, the report came out and there is this little video with uh, James McDonald, the physicist, the American physicist who later committed suicide, unfortunately, because of ridicule. Some people say he was killed. Okay, I, I'm not saying that. Um, he committed, he, he did one attempt which failed and lay, he turned blind and he did it a second time again. And he was found dead. It's such a waste. I mean, a brilliant physicist. Um, and uh, the other one was uh, Donald Kehoe. And they spoke together about uh, this report, Condon report. And they said, this is, this is crazy. This is a crazy report. And it's history repeating. Because if we see that happening now with um, the Arrow report again. But what I find strange is that Senator Gillibrand funded, she made sure this Aero report, this Aero office was funded. She said she wanted more transparency. She even said on a video, which is on Twitter, that Aero did find evidence. And now this report. If I was the senator, mm-hmm. I was, I would be like, okay, Mr. Kirkpatrick, uh, what are you doing? Because this was meant to cause more transparency and look what you're doing. <laughs> but she's yeah. silent. She's silent. And that's what I find strange. There are strange things happening. And I think uh, that it's like this. She genuinely wanted transparency, but I think the DOD came in between. And they probably said to her, don't go this, eh? stop. That's what they do, mm-hmm. I think. And so she's silent, especially after David Grush, because um, Senator Gillibrand said on a meeting somewhere in the country, she said, ah, this guy now comes forward. And I was saying, this guy, it's an intelligent, he's from the intelligence. Uh, eh? And he, I mean, he was, a, he was a veteran. This guy is strange. Yeah. It's very strange. It's interesting how the first like couple pages of the Arrow report They just straight up tell you, we just looked at all of the other reports we put out over the last 50 years that we we, (laughs) that we designed to tell you nothing. And we found that there's nothing there. So it's just the greatest hits. It's like a greatest hit CD. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I I understand it from their perspective. I mean, um, imagine 
if this truth comes out and they have to admit we lied to you <laughs> for all this time. That's yes, we are, si- we, are, we are sitting on uh, exotic technology because let's mm-hmm. be honest, that's happening. For instance, let me g- give a little example. There was this crash in uh, Brazil, the Virginia crash. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people say, ah, it's nonsense and blah, blah, blah. But what I find interesting is that um, there were uh, there was a military craft landing the next day or in the days after, unmarked. It was a military aircraft from the United States military. But the uh, controller of the tower, he said, there was this aircraft coming in and he didn't have any, uh, that's what, what they call in, uh, Avum in uh, Brazil, that you announce that, that, that you're arriving. But there was no announcement. That's crazy because it's already crazy mm-hmm. that an American aircraft lands there, let alone that it has no announcement of uh, pre, uh, that is saying, okay, hello, we are from the military. No, nothing like that. And they couldn't land in Virginia. They landed in on the airstrip of uh, Campinas. From there, two helicopters got up and went to Virginia. And that's where the whole thing happened with the hospital and the beings and et cetera, et cetera. But there were also military people from the U.S. there instructing the local military what to do because they have their <laughs> scripts, of course. And there was this woman who said, um, yeah, we couldn't talk because the society would collapse. And this was an ordinary woman from the streets, you know. uh, And I was like, okay, this is in, um, in in a report from NASA. Because NASA commissioned a report and their conclusion was, um, um, it was in early 60s, I forgot the name. Um, the conclusion was that society would collapse. And I was like, how can you know that? In Brazil, rural area, how can you know mm-hmm. the, 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 the content of a report that is in essence still secret, that society mm-hmm. would collapse? This is what the people were told. And that's what the Americans told the military in Brazil. You have to do this because otherwise society will collapse. Of course, people will uh, do their thing, you know. And these are the little nuggets I find interesting because it's uh, and and this operator said they landed there and when they went back, they had their uh, their sign on that it was Air Force, United States Air Force. So for me, and and there is now, of course, they say that there is a CIA uh, access, global access, uh, office of global access, global access pro- program. Yeah, well, this is it. This is it. There is a crash. This is it. And the United States lands there. Does it? They do their thing, and they clean the whole mess up, <laughs> and they take the beings with them. Are you them. familiar? There's a another case in Peru uh, with a Marine. Are you familiar with this guy? Like and he tells the story about a, a, a crash that happened in Peru, and he was—I think uh-huh. he was a, a corporal. I mean, he was a pretty low rank guy. And, and yeah. then the guys came in, and they had no insignia on their uniform, mm-hmm. and they said, "We're going to throw you out of a helicopter in the jungle. You can't talk about this." Uh, this is pretty crude, two-dimensional drawing, but this is jungle here. And this was the craft, and it, it was embedded uh, in in the in, in the rock like this, and I. I'm not sure if this tapered off or, or how it went, but uh, these right here are the hatches, these two objects here. This one was the one that was half open and you could see into it, but I mean, it was just black. It was like looking into a closet. 10 meters in width and about 20 meters in length. I'm just not sure, that's just an estimate from what I remember, but it was huge. I mean, it was big, man. And it was shaped like almost like between an egg and like a teardrop almost. It was really, it looked really aerodynamic, at least in shape, but the closer I, I was close enough to take out detail on it, but every, every, it was not just smooth. There was, there was, you know, there was bumps and, you know, notches and things in it. It was really organic. It was almost like art. I, that, that, that's really how you would, 
It didn't look like something that, that somebody made in a shop, you know? It looked to be that it was, it, it could have been handmade, but you know, out of what, and you know, what materials, I don't know. It, see, this is the whole thing. It looked metal, but it, it didn't, it didn't have any reflection on it, man. I mean, you know, the, 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 the sun's coming down and if you got something made of metal, regardless of it, I mean, maybe if it's subdued with paint and it's got a cami sheen on it, you know, you're not gonna see a reflection. But, you know, I could see the different, the different shades of the craft. They didn't shine, it, it just like it was, it didn't reflect anything. And, and I guarantee if I'd, if I'd have thrown like a, a flashlight on it, it wouldn't have reflected it. There was, a, there was one light on it that slowly went around and, it, and, and the machine, I could hear it. I could hear, I guess, cause it was still functioning and it had like a, like a, a hum to it, like, like a really bass, like say if you unplugged an amp from a guitar, that kind of, mm, you know, it was really, really, you know, it was really deep and it kind of fluctuated and then finally it just cut off and everything just seemed to stop. But uh, I felt this presence. I thought the creatures were, they calling me and, and it was like weird and they were, I think they were trying to communicate with me. Like, I guess telepathically, it's really weird. It's like basically sitting in your car and turning on like an AM station that's not, that you, you know, it's just white noise and it's turning it up really high. After we climbed back up, the, uh, the, the, I think the DOE, Department of Energy people were there. They knew about it. Uh, I had all my gear taken from me by men and black hammies had no, no name tags. They, they were older men, probably in their third, late 30s or 40s. They were there and they had containment suits and they, where they landed two CH-47 Chinooks. There are army uh, uh, twin rotor, uh, you know, helicopters and they're big and they had guys coming out in these containment suits. They must have just got there, I don't know, while we were down in the gorge, because when we climbed up, there those guys were. And the, well, there were the, the guys in the black camis. And then they took me, they put me on a cot that they had and they had me uh, cuffed with those, uh, they had me cuff both hands down and then they had my, uh, my, my, my legs tied together with those, those uh, plastic fasteners that the police use. I don't know, you know, they're like kind of like cuffs. And then they took me in the CH-47 and they, 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 we, we took off and, and uh, they had a, a lieutenant colonel from the Air Force and he did not I identify himself. And he told me, you know, you know, uh, you know if we just, uh, took you out in the jungle, you know, they'd never find you out there. And I'm like, well, and you know, I, I didn't want to say, you know, you know, I didn't want to test him to see if you'd really do that. So I said, yeah. And he's like, you got to sign these papers and you never saw this and I don't exist. And this situation never happened. Yeah. But he yeah. saw the craft. He actually yeah. got up close to the craft. He was able to see it from a few mm -hmm. feet away. Yes. Yeah. And there are a lot of crashes, you know, and how is it possible that so many crashes are still so easy to uh to wrap up uh it's, it's it's strange but generally these crashes happen in rural areas uh for instance when you uh, when you look at roswell um set shostak the scientist from seti you know him he yeah. said um he said well ah, a crash in uh, new mexico ah, what were they looking for the new mexico cuisine and they crashed there. And I was like, you dirty bastard. You know. That food is delicious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course that's what they were looking for. Of course they crashed there. I mean, the first nuclear tests were there. You as a scientist should know that. So you are mm -hmm. playing the public by saying, what are they doing there? They like the cuisine and like with looking like this, it's playing the public. Because the people who yeah. don't have any interest in this subject, they say, yeah, yeah, you're right. What do they, uh, what do they find in New Mexico? Nothing. It's only desert. But we know that they had a lot to find there eh? because of the Trinity uh, 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 experiment Trinity, yeah. or explosion. The first atomic bombs uh, exploded there. So, of course, they were there. So, and Sh Seth Shostak, as a scientist, should know that. But the fact that he is saying things by for playing the public, it's the same like, no, they were uh, crash test dummies. They didn't exist yeah. in 1947. Um, Stanton Friedman said, ah, that's nice. We have crash test dummies uh, traveling in time. 
as one of the founders and, and, and the moderator on UFOB, you, mm-hmm. you have a perspective that a lot of people don't have. And Reddit is, as Pix said in our uh, interview a few weeks ago, probably Reddit is the, probably the largest repository of UFO information on the internet. And certainly yes. it's where much of the conversation is happening. There's UFO Twitter and mm-hmm. then there's Reddit. And mm-hmm. Reddit, I think, is probably much bigger in yes. terms of just total content and people talking. Yeah. Um, I have noticed, and I've I've heard others, and I've seen posts about this a lot, and I'm very curious about, um, it seems like there's an organized campaign to meddle in the conversation on Reddit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Do you see evidence of this? And and what yeah. I, and for those who don't, who who may not know, I'll give you a, a, just a specific example. Would be, um, the word grifter. It's a word that most people don't ever use. But when you go into um, UFOs or aliens, or I'm talking about on Reddit, the subreddits, UFOs, aliens, um, you, and you pick pick any alien related or UFO related mm-hmm. subreddit, and you see something on like Danny Sheehan. Underneath all the comments will be grifter, grifter, grifter. This guy's a grifter. He's just trying to make money. Grifter, grifter. 150 comments. And then you click on the screen name for the person and it's an account that's 42 days old. It has no history. It's a nobody account. It's obviously a bot or it's a troll or it's something. Mm -hmm. Um, As one of the moderators, what are are you seeing and what do you make of it? What's going on there? Yeah, I see it on uh, Twitter as well, uh, the X. Uh, nowadays, um, for instance, um, I was talking to somebody and he's constantly um, uh, like, yeah, grifter, blah, blah, blah. And then I made a screenshot and I sent it and I noticed no response. It was like, okay, you're artificial intelligence because you cannot read the screenshot. <laughs> Try it when you engage with these people, especially on X, because then you can send a screenshot of your text but artificial intelligence doesn't read it. Mm. So then it's end of the conversation. And it's odd because they are really putting artificial intelligence now to engage with people. Because of course you do that because you cannot put a troll factory. I mean, it's just a lot of money to put people, but also when you ask a person to, uh, to do it, they ask questions. Well, why should I downplay UFOs? Why? Uh, then somebody's thinking, okay, <laughs> you know, but artificial intelligence can do it for you. And that's what they use, uh, especially on Twitter. Uh, Reddit, uh, a lot of people, uh, Reddit um, said that a lot of uh, astroturfing came from El- Eglin Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. And um, it's possible that um, people are asked to downplay the subject. It's possible. Um, why? Um, you know, this is mainly uh, uh, being kept secret by the military. And I think personally that the military uh, of in Europe and uh, the United States, they cooperate with each other. And um, they, they probably brief each other on the basic uh, aspects, especially uh, in, in the West. Uh, Australia, uh, the five eyes, eh, five eyes, yeah, five eyes. So there has to be because UFOs don't stop at the border. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so you think, uh, from your vantage point as one of the mods, do you see any meddling in UFOB? Do you do you come across that? Yes, I see uh, people. Uh, for instance. Um, uh, speaking very negatively, and I am, and I always look at the history of the person. What did you do? Uh, have you been on UFOB before? No, mm-hmm. nothing. And suddenly, there you are. So sometimes we decide to uh, remove such a negative comment, but it's also a difficult one because when you remove comments, people say, "Ah, you're removing comments," and uh, you have to keep it. Uh, like, uh, you know, also criticism you have to accept. Okay, that's true. That's true. Um, but on the other hand, then you have people saying, why don't you remove this comment? <laughs> because uh, you're a UFO uh, sub and uh, you're saying that it exists. You're saying that it's uh, 
exotic eh, intelligence or non-human intelligence. So why don't you remove it? So it's difficult to satisfy everybody. It's very difficult. Uh, and I think you have to find a balance in that. Yeah, and that's what we... Uh, and of course, there are a lot of people uh, promoting their own content. And I don't mind, you know, as long as it's good content. I really don't mind. Mm. But um, it should not be become too commercial. And But I, I'm proud of what we achieved. And um, we're now heading to the 100,000 subscribers on Reddit. And um, on Twitter, I, I believe... 40, 45,000. So we're growing and uh, in, in a good way, you know, not too fast because growing too fast is not, not, not good as well. Yeah. And I, I see it more like um, we're one family and that's how I see it. You're part of a community. So you're, you are in essence a family. That's how I see it. And uh, that's how we have to behave. And a lot of people fight over this subject uh, uh, online. No, it's dem demonic. No, it's interdimensional. No, it's ET. You know what I mean? I mean, look <laughs> at what you have in common. Don't look at your di the differences. Because otherwise... It's so confusing. Is, yeah. It is. It's so confusing. And I think you have, you have genuine cases that are extraterrestrial or non-human. Then you have cases that are super advanced human technology, probably reverse engineered technology mm -hmm. that are being mistaken for UFOs or yes. UAP. Mm -hmm. And then there are other cases that seem more esoteric contact cases, in particular crop circles, yeah. um, you know, a, a abductions yeah. that seem to be somewhat on the periphery, but also related in a very yeah. interesting way. And I wonder what are your, we talked a little bit at the beginning about uh, abductions. And it seems like in the 90s, I remember this very well. There were uh, Bud Hopkins, John Mack, Carla Turner, yeah. Dave Jacobs, uh, yes. and a few other researchers that really looked at this. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. And now there's yes. no one. I don't know of anyone today who's looking at this. What is, no. what is your opinion on the abduction phenomenon? Um, well, um, when we, I have to go to David Grush because David Grush said this is a, 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 an interdimensional phenomenon. That's what he said. Recently, Anna Paulina Luna, uh, the representative, also mentioned it in the after coming out of the skiff. Mm -hmm. So, um, but what is interdimensional, and that is important. Because people say, okay, well, we have the four dimensions or some say we have nine dimensions. Okay. And it's one of the dimensions is where they come from. But there is this physicist uh, from the United States, a brilliant man, Hugh Everett. Hugh Everett. And Hugh Everett said that um, it's an idea that comes from physics universes can split and it's a, uh, a um, it comes from quantum mechanics and of course it's an interpretation it's not even a theory but imagine if that is true then all the pieces of the puzzle in my opinion come together because in this many worlds hypoth hypothesis the earth exists in many places and different versions of you walk around on these places. So uh, it's crazy to think about, but on a certain uh, earth, you are already dead. And on another one, you won the lottery and you're a billionaire. And on another one, you're doing a podcast, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I'm in the wrong uh, one. I need to get to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, okay, this, this is an interpretation. It's not even a theory. But this physicist was really ridiculed, you know, and uh, he later went working for the military and then he died uh, unhappy. And nowadays you see that they're starting to uh, look at his work again. And maybe can you can show um, an image of him, a picture. Yeah, this guy. 
Yeah. You see what a large forehead he has? <laughs> it's a lot of brain. Uh, <laughs> a lot of brain in there. <laughs> a lot of brain in there. Yes. And there's a nice video of his son telling about his father and how difficult it was because he wasn't really the social type, you know, but he was a brilliant physicist. And I think we're going to hear more of him. That's my, my intuition that, ha that it will happen. Because if you show the other, the image I sent to you by mail, this one, yes. Well, it looks a little bit complex, but when you see these, these, these universes splitting up, uh, parallel Earths, parallel uh, worlds, eh? you can imagine. And then you see uh, on the right side, you see these UFOs uh, in this interpretation, eh? because it's not a theory, but an interpretation, jumping between the worlds. You see? And that represents the red line. Um, and the blue line uh, represents a possible way to time travel because they jump uh, in a different way. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, why do I think that this is, that this is, is something, this is interdimensional. This is traveling interdimensional. And why is it related to abductions? In my opinion, my personal opinion, I can be totally wrong, of course, but I think there's something to this, is when you're from another planet, and when you come to the earth and the, and you want to hybridize, you know, hybridization between humans and something else, how is that even possible? Because um, the life developed totally differently on another planet. The chemistry is different. The, maybe there isn't even DNA involved. And if it is, maybe it has a totally different structure. It's impossible. It's virtually impossible to do hybridization, to perform it. It's impossible. So why is it working? Possibly. Why are they creating uh, hybrids if that is true? Well, in this parallel world scenario, it is possible because all these planets, all these Earths are splitting and splitting and splitting. But that means there are different versions of you. But there are, mm. when an Earth split it uh, a few million years ago, uh, there was life, but it developed, develops differently. Maybe we are related. Maybe the greys are us from another par parallel world, but their whole biologic biology uh, developed differently over time. And that means that hybridization is possible. You know, it's, a th it's just an idea, but... Um, why can they walk around on this planet? Why can they breathe here in our atmosphere? Because they walk around, generally, they walk around unprotected. If I, if we go to another planet, the first thing we need is a helmet mm -hmm. to breathe. But they don't need it. They walk around here. Um, how is that possible? They are used to our gravity because another planet generally is bigger or maybe much smaller. And um, they get crushed or... Or well, they get blown up, <laughs> you know. So, how is this? This is there is something we are missing, and that's uh, what I try to show. That this is one possibility of them. First of all, knowing how our our future will develop, because they can just jump to another world and see what our future is, and go back. And in this way. Uh, some people say, no, they are time travelers. Uh, other people say, no, they are us from the future. Um, so in this theory, everything comes together. And in this theory, hybridization works as well. We know life exists here. So if you just start here, uh, then it, you don't really have to invoke a galactic federation or anything else outside yeah. of earth, you can just say, okay, yeah. well in the future on one version of earth, mm -hmm. somebody develops yes. the capability to travel into other parallel versions. Yes. That would make sense. Yeah. And perhaps they share technology between uh, the parallel earths. Um, and that's crazy because there are so many strange beings coming here and seeing even humans. 
even humans. In, I think that's what's so interesting is the the variety of of beings mm-hmm. that people report seeing. There's so many different types, and the grays are are very ubiquitous. We we hear about short grays and tall grays, mm-hmm. and then uh, just going back to the abductee thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are cases where people uh, report being taken, they go on board a craft. When, when they're taken, they're taken by the greys. They go on board the craft, something's done to them. There's, a, there's an experiment or some type of, of medical procedure or some research process mm-hmm. that goes on. That's when they meet the tall grey. Yeah. Usually there's one or two tall greys, maybe a dozen small greys, or there are many small greys, but one or two tall greys. Yes. And then occasionally you hear about the praying mantis insectoid types and then we hear about reptilians yeah and it starts to sound like when i started researching abductions the i, I fixate on, on that aspect of it a lot because these are people who are claiming to have been inside the craft they actually have mm-hmm. seen and talked to mm-hmm. and and interacted with these beings so if you were trying to figure out what their motivations are why are they here what is it they're trying to accomplish Yes. abductees would be the place to go. That's where your yes. information is. Yes. On the absolutely. outside, all we can really see are, are reports. We see lights. Mm-hmm. Maybe we have some satellite images. That's, yeah. But we actually have people that are going on board these craft, allegedly, and um, coming back with very similar stories. And it's all very yes. interesting. Like the reptilian thing, there could be a version of Earth where the dinosaurs did not go extinct. They continued to exactly. evolve. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. And form a, technolo- a technological civilization, or there's yes. a version of Earth where insects go on and, and, and evolve and be, they become the dominant species. Bingo. Yeah. So this, this and, and that's what I mean with this theory and this theory or interpretation, all the pieces of the puzzle come together. The cra- it's a crazy puzzle. And because when you speak about somebody, uh, te- again, t- to somebody about uh, mantis, they are like, huh? <laughs> you know, what's this? What are mm-hmm. you talking about? But in this theory, every piece of the puzzle comes together, and so we have to we have to focus on it because maybe there is something to it. And um, but of course, this also explains maybe cattle mutilations because you they collect DNA from here. Imagine that um, there are planets where that need need to be uh, or, or where the DNA is degenerating because of wars, uh, nuclear wars or something. It's totally, uh, you can imagine that um, that they need a refreshment of the DNA and th- they can easily get it here, you know? So, or maybe they are seeding other plants with life. It's also possible. But um, uh, this theory, it, this is the interdimensional theory, in fact. And it comes from physics. So... We have to do more with this, I think, but that's my personal opinion. And uh, again, and it, I can it, be totally wrong. But It gets even more interesting too, right? Because we also have people who report, and I think um, this is very common, that they see humans mm-hmm. or beings yes. that look indistinguishable exactly. from you and me and everyone else, except maybe they're, yeah. they're all six feet, uh, 10 inches tall, and they have, yes. you know, <laughs> they're built yeah. like bodybuilders. For some reason, yeah. they seem like genetically superior human beings, right? Yes. And there is this, this Philadelphia experiment. It's still a very, yeah, it's rumors, you know, but is there something to it? But because uh, this, this fits also into that theory that we can jump maybe to the other worlds. Yeah. And what if it goes wrong, you know, with this ship, the Eldritch? I don't know if you know about the experiment, the Philadelphia This is where the supposedly the sailors rematerialized and people were sticking out of the wall yes, and their exactly. arms were <laughs> yes. fused to the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There's a scene no. in, uh, I don't know, are you a big Star Trek person? Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. There's a scene in Star Trek, the motion picture. Remember the very first one where they test the transporter. There's something wrong with the transporter and they beam somebody on board and oh, yeah. they're, they, they're turned into like goo because the transporter <laughs> malfunctioned. Yeah. I feel like that's, that's yeah. basically the idea, right? The, yes, yeah, exactly. Eldritch. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's um, maybe we are already good at it, you know? Maybe reverse engineering uh, also means that we are already... Uh, jumping to other worlds 
how is that? that's a crazy idea, but it's possible. And of course you want mm. to keep that secret because that means that you, you can decide what the future is like, yeah, for instance. So it is, it's, it's crazy and it's still a fringe, but it's, it's good to, it makes, to think about it. Yeah. It, it's an interesting thought because it does also like, I think about the nuclear connection, right? So there's a few different mm -hmm. things going on there. The nuclear connection could be, the universe is full of nuclear explosions and fusion. And I mean, it's the universe is a very violent space is yes. a very violent, dangerous place. There's a lot of Absolutely. things that can kill you. And the human made nuclear weapon is probably the least among them, like that any alien yeah. should be worried about unless yeah. they're already here, in which case then it's a threat to the biosphere. And maybe the biosphere as a whole is more interest. They're more interested in protecting that than, than, than us specifically. Yes. But yeah. it could also be that a nuclear explosion here on Earth reverberates through other adjacent versions of Earth, and they yes. are able to detect that the same way that we can detect ripples yes. in gravity waves from exactly. the Big Bang or yeah. something like that. And that's how they're able to hone in yes. on our our universe at a particular time, almost mm -hmm. like a like a QR code. They can just go there. Yes. Because that's where the it's, explosion um, happened. It's like a tree, and when you have a branch and you uh, you cut it, you, know, you saw it for, for a part, it will die. The entire branch will die. And it's like uh, Earth, if, you know, if we uh, split up all the time, you know, our universe and many worlds will, uh, and, and we blow our world up, then it reverberates and the, whole, the entire branch will die off, you know? So uh. yeah, that's how I see it. And uh, maybe they are trying to prevent it. And many abductees see screens with events that are going to happen on this planet. And they see wars, they see the misery, they see environmental problems. And maybe they can jump to our future in parallel worlds because they know what the outcome is, is going to be. And uh, but we still have a choice. And maybe that's the whole thing that they want to show us. We have a choice to change the outcome. Because it may have happened on a parallel world, but not on ours. I wonder how much of the secrecy is about the actual uh, collapse of society. Like, I, I don't know if I buy that. Like, what does that even mean society would collapse? Does that just mean that most people would stop wanting to go to their shitty job and go to work for some <laughs> stupid boss that they don't like, you know, like if, if you, if you yeah. found out tomorrow that there's a starship yeah. in orbit, that is yeah. like a million years more advanced and there's this whole yeah. civilization, like, how, yeah. do you really want to go, <laughs> go on with the stupid game that we're all playing? Or yeah. maybe the secrecy has more to do with the legal entanglements of how many people would have to go to jail if it really yeah. came out all yeah. of the stuff that they've done to cover it up. I feel like that's gotta be more, What's going on? Yes. And what that's the thing. That's the thing. You know, a lot of Americans pay their taxes and um, the Department of Defense uh, didn't pass six audits by now. Six audits, you know. And um, what are they doing with this money? Money from the public. I mean, it, it's, it disappears. And it's like there is a, some kind of an elite who can do whatever they want. And the public is just paying for it and working very yeah. hard for it, but doesn't benefit from it. Now that's strange. Yeah. Because the, yeah. In, a normal, in a normal situation, uh, they develop technology and it benefits the world and or it benefits at least the Americans, but nothing like that is happening. Yeah, we protect you. Okay, how? Yeah, it's, it's te uh, uh, secret technology. Okay, but how can we, how can we even check if that is happening? You know, so there is something yeah. strange happening. It's the same with NASA. Everybody paid. I mean, this this new telescope, billions of uh, of dollars, and what do people benefit from it? We have seen one mm -hmm. picture, or a few pictures, I must say, but we have seen one picture above space, and you really think they didn't see by now things that are. Crazy, of course. I already heard about uh, certain uh, of scientists saying, "Oh my God!" But the implications is, is incredible, and then they were silent. So they already discovered things, but they keep it silent, and that's what I hate about this whole thing. 
uh, that in, in essence you create an elite that has access to mm. knowledge and the people are keep it, are kept dumb and it's a big shame i think that's what's going on right now i think that's yes. why the secrecy is starting to fall apart mm-hmm. because after 75 years of this Uh There has been so much cross-pollination. I mean, think about it. It starts out as a very controlled, very tight program, very small, uh, maybe only a few specific people pulled from the Uh Atomic uh, Energy Commission and a few other places. Some Nazi scientists from Paperclip put on this. And then as the years go on, the technology is farmed out to corporations. They start to reverse engineer it. Uh Engineers leave. They go start other companies, Uh different people. The companies merge Things change yeah. hands. Yeah. I think by now, they probably don't even know who has what technology anymore. I think a lot of these programs have become, it's gone from one program into many programs. <laughs> and so there's some overlap, but I don't think the left hand even knows what the right hand's doing anymore. No. And that's just in the United States. As you mentioned, yeah. I mean, we have, and, and you're Dutch, you guys have great social services here in the United States. We've been told for my entire life, we can't afford health care. We can't afford college education. We can't afford this. We can't afford that. We can't afford any entitlements. We're just, we don't have the money. But the military, we have enough money to give them anything they want forever. And I feel yeah. like by now, the amount of breakthroughs <clears throat> that, that have probably happened, you can't have 75 years of research no. with an unlimited budget without making some amazing no. progress. No. The United States is the, the United States is the richest country on the planet. Think about that. The richest mm-hmm. country on the planet. Where is the healthcare system? The good healthcare system. Where is it? You can have 10 mm-hmm. of them. You can have 20 of them. Easily. Where is it? Where is that money going? Infrastructure, I hear a lot of Americans complain about the bridges, the, the roads, etc. How is it possible that in Europe you can, uh, the, the roads are good, at least in, in Holland, I can, uh, you know. Um, this is also possible in the United States. Um, when you're, uh, when you're fired, huh? uh, you can have an income in, in the Netherlands. It happens when you get fired, your, the, the government pays you and you get a, a possibility to go to find another job. And in, meanwhile, mm-hmm. you don't have to sell your house. How come yeah. it's not possible in the United States? It is possible. I actually know a guy. I know a guy who, during the COVID lockdowns, actually had to sell his house. He he <laughs> got uh, downsized from his job. Yeah, and had to sell his home, and then he wound up renting a home f- from somebody else mm-hmm. to live in. And then mm-hmm. another guy had to sell his car. Mm-hmm. The United yes. States is a, is a scary place, and I, I say that now as a as a father of a young young child, and yeah. and I think about it differently than when it's just you. You're like, oh, yeah. I'll figure it out. But when you have a yeah. family, you start to think about these yeah. things. And I think yes. about this a lot. It's yes. it's terrifying. The it idea is. of if you are not, you either have, you, you have to be a success mm-hmm. or you are forgotten and left to die. And that's yes. just how it is here. Yes. And it is, you know, Americans are good people. I engage with them every day. Lovely people. But they all have one thing in common. They don't trust the government. Mm-hmm. And that's um, one of the most important things to know that um, I think personally, but it's my conspiracy. My personal conspiracy is that after Kennedy, something changed. I call it a silent coup d'etat. And in essence, the DOD or the Pentagon is ruling the country and they're not doing it very well. And it's a conspiracy. I have to say it, (laughs) but in everything I see, everything I research, everything I do, I think this is, I think this happens. And, um, because for instance, the Iran Contra affair, if you really t- take a look at it, um, the CIA, uh, drug trafficking, sorry, how is this inf- even possible? Uh, mm-hmm. And they and, and then there were hearings and they didn't do anything with it. Why? Well, it could be detrimental to government as a whole. Yeah, fuck it. You know, it's a crime, mm-hmm. and you have to and, and you have to put these people behind bars. Period. Yeah, it didn't happen, and now it happens again. 
with with this arrow and these lies around UFOs. And I, uh, what are you doing? What is what what do you want? And and the thing I I I have the idea that um, the they are sitting on exotic technology. They are not going to share it with the American citizens. Never. They want Never. this technology for themselves. And that's the dilemma that the Congress of the United States is now facing. Because if these people s- succeed in back reverse engineering, they become rulers of the planet. And this is facilitated at this moment. So the Congress has to hurry up now and uh, make sure that uh, there is more transparency and that these people uh, get behind the bars or get behind bars or they get immunity or whatever, but they have to do something. Uh, to leave it like this is, uh, is impossible. You cannot do it. I, I yeah. feel like the situation is very unstable right now. And I yes. think that the instability, the, geo, the, the global strategic situation is what's pushing this forward. I, my sense is that there's the United States program, which is run in tandem with Europe and Australia. Mm-hmm. That, that's all one, uh, not one program, but that's one faction, right? Mm-hmm. Then you have Russia and China. That's yes. probably, maybe India is doing their yes. own thing just because of the <clears throat> amount of space that they, they mm-hmm. have to, to monitor. Mm-hmm. But um, my sense is that somebody else has made some breakthroughs and maybe they're a little further along than we are. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. there is a question about um, the United States cannot maintain control over disclosure forever. Sooner or later, no. What if China dis, uh, demonstrates a functional anti-gravity craft publicly yes. yeah. and suddenly China yeah. is leading the world and they have anti-gravity yes. technology out in the open? How could the United States suddenly come out and say, oh, we, well, yeah. we have it too. We've had it for 50 years. Yeah. We just didn't tell you about it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. if they're gonna, it, it's going to be um, something like that is my sense, a very human yes kind of stupid thing that's going to bring all of this out mm-hmm. into the open. Like Vladimir Putin only has to say to the Americans, your government is lying to you because they are hiding uh, exotic technology. It will create havoc, you know? I mean, mm-hmm. that's the he has this weapon in his hand and he can use it. The reason he is not using it probably is because he has to explain things to his own uh, people. But on the other hand, it's a totalitarian regime, so it's not difficult to keep the people in line. But in a, for a democracy, it's devastating because people will, will be angry, um, they will not trust the government, etc. So Putin has this weapon in his hands and he can use it. And that's the vulnerability that uh, the intelligence community and uh, the DOD, in fact, is creating. It's a vulnerability, and I call it, a, 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 it's, it's like a danger to national security. That's what they are creating. And uh, Be transparent, be honest. How difficult is it? Your citizens are not children. I and, think there's, um, a great, uh, there's a great quote. Are, are you um, a fan of Colonel Corso, Phil yes. Corso? Yes. Did you ever see yeah. that interview with him where he says, uh, he's like, people tell the, the people... people Yes. Because we sent 18-year-old kids and 17-year-old kids into machine gun fire in World War II, and mm-hmm. we trusted them to do that. We, we, they fought a war that mm-hmm. nobody else today could, could fight, and it was just no. a different mindset. So why can't yes. they handle this? Yeah. Yes. I, think a, what- I also think there's a sense of, of competing— um, there are like, th- I, I see three different things happening at the same time. And I want to get your thoughts on this. It seems like our best science tells us that the biosphere is collapsing and that if we don't radically change the way that we produce energy on this planet within 50 years, mm-hmm. we won't really be able to maintain an organized global civilization anymore. Mm-hmm. It'll be too chaotic. Mm-hmm. And and for people who don't follow this every day, what I'm talking about is 8 billion people have to eat regularly, three meals a yes. day, at least one meal a day to survive and to continue on with this whole thing that we're doing, mm-hmm. right? And if we get yeah. to a point where the climate is so unstable that we can't grow grain at scale and you can't grow corn, wheat, um, you know, mm-hmm. oats, whatever, the, the rice 
the staple crops to feed that many people, you're going to have chaos. So you have the environmental catastrophe, and we know that's happening. Then we have artificial intelligence, which some say, even today, right now, as we sit here having this conversation, some have suggested that there's already artificial general intelligence in the lab Mm -hmm. that could explode into artificial super intelligence any moment. And it might already be out in the wild that we don't even know about. It could be hidden somewhere Mm -hmm. in the internet, just lurking. And then you have the UFO, UAP, non-human intelligence Mm -hmm. thing. And those three, out of those three things, the collapse of the biosphere has a ticking clock attached to it. We can pretty much predict when that's going to take place. Mm -hmm. We're already Mm -hmm. seeing... Uh, the global the uh, surface open temperature is yeah. is uh, higher than it's ever been, and it's it's yeah. frightening. And we know that artificial intelligence is at worst fifty years away, mm-hmm. twenty years away. Mm-hmm. Could be could be next year. Could be here now. Yeah. We don't know, but it's coming. So, yeah. of those two, I, the, the the question of non human intelligence of those three things, two of them involve us human beings not being at the top of the food chain anymore. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a really strange time to be alive because we're watching all of this unfold all around us. And I wonder how much of these things are connected to each other. Is is the interest in uh, in Earth and our civilization right now because uh, we're destroying the biosphere? Is it because we're creating artificial life? Is it both? You know, what do you think? <sighs> It's, um, it's, I see it as a, a point of convergence, you know, everything comes together at, at some point. And, um, I see, I, I'm a pessimist. I'm not an optimist. And that's because I'm also a realist. I see the things happening and you can calculate already that this go is going to, uh, this is going to enter to the wrong direction. And nobody wants to give up their life. Nobody wants to give up flying. Nobody wants to give up uh, eating meat and stuff. And that's, I think, what governments do wrong. They, uh, for instance, do you know Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum? Yeah. <laughs> this guy said, okay, you will own nothing, but you will be happy. Uh, in fact, he's trying to get some communism, you know, uh, spread communism around. And they are interfering with the food. And so, in fact, they are already creating uh, a system, to my, in my opinion, to keep the people in line. For instance, they want digital currency. And this digital currency is easy because when you add a social credit system to it, um, every time you uh, uh, do something wrong or you have a big mouth about your government, they can close down your bank accounts <laughs> and you cannot go mm-hmm. to the store. You can do nothing because there is no cash. Mm-hmm. But this is where they want us to go. So they are already creating now systems to keep the people uh, in line and to keep us um, silent and to keep us, uh, yeah, to prevent uh, uh people from uh, starting a revolution or something. So on high level, they already talk about it, how to do it. And it's, it's, it's dangerous because this is a period in which we have to fight for our freedom, really have to fight for our freedom. And, um, but on the other hand, we have to act also. We cannot live the way we always did, especially when you, yeah. uh, we are now with 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, I think we can um, maintain a lot of a lot more people on this planet, but yeah, when when there are billionaires becoming even richer and richer every day, yeah, we can have a discussion with each other. Is that what we want? Because um, some people get everything and some people get nothing. But yeah, the problem mm-hmm. is that people will always say, ah, communism or socialism, yeah. And that's also always a difficult uh, discussion. Maybe, maybe you have to call it a fair share and, and leave the whole communism thing and the socialism out because it's, uh, people don't like it, you know. But when you say that we have to share everything or um, share it in a, in, a, in a more humane way, everybody would agree. I don't know that this is true, but I just suspect that uh, some of the 
motivation for whistleblowers coming forward to try and get this information out has something to do with the declining state of the environment right now and how fast things are. I, I think if you really wanted to look for a conspiracy theory, if you want to look mm-hmm. for a conspiracy, uh, I hate that word, but <laughs> it seems to me that the cons- the real conspiracy is that climate change is a lot worse than they've told us. It's just way worse, way, way, way worse. And I'm also, I share your pessimistic attitude. Sometimes mm-hmm. I, I, I get really um, down on, on the situation because it's, uh, it's scary. And you see yeah. the people who are at the, uh, the, the most educated uh, on this, they're very n- nervous about, um, mm-hmm. it, they're saying the window to take action is, is really closing yeah. if it's not already closed. Yeah. And we're talking like 10 years and mm-hmm. not just 10 years to start making changes, 10 years to yeah. stop flying, stop driving, yeah. pump no oil out of the ground, completely stop all of it. And mm-hmm. then we have to throw it in reverse and start pulling carbon out of the atmosphere because we've yeah. put so much in the atmosphere. And I wonder how much of the push for disclosure, I often say David Grush, when he first came Mm -hmm. forward, he was 36 years old. Mm -hmm. The people in the program aren't 75 years old. They're Mm -hmm. they're in their 30s. They're in their 40s. Mm -hmm. They have children. Mm -hmm. They have families. They have, uh, and they are engineers. They're scientists. They can read the data. They look at what's going on. Yeah. And maybe they know that we're sitting on the technology to to leapfrog to Star Trek technology. Mm -hmm. And we could do that inside yes. of a, a 20 year period, if we could just get the information out. I shared a video on Twitter uh, recently about a man, uh, Stan uh, Stanley was his name. And he um, developed a way to uh, split the hydrogen atoms and oxygen from water. And, uh, and the way he did it was, uh, with, uh, there's much more energy coming out than went in. So uh, he developed a car that would drive on water. Uh, of course, it drives on hydrogen, but um, then um, there was uh, interest from the Pentagon, and it's all there because it's all in the news. And then when finally he had a, a meeting with NATO officials, and they, he was going to sign a contract, and he died. <laughs> On the spot. <laughs> and, you know. It's funny how okay. that works. You can say like, okay, maybe it was a fraud because they say, no, he was a fraud. But what if it's true? Maybe he did find a way because he said uh, a high uh, pulsating frequency uh, splits the atom, uh, atoms, uh, not the atoms, splits the uh, the molecule into uh, hydrogen atoms and, uh, and um, hydrogen and ex- oxygen. So what if it's true? Then they just killed a person who literally gave the world clean energy to drive. And that means that the whole system we have now is maintained, but to make a few people rich. But what, what good is it to be filthy rich on a planet that dies? Don't these yeah. people have children and grandchildren? Don't they want a better future? So what good is it to keep this system when there are already scientific breakthroughs to, uh, to, to get more clean energy, for instance? I don't understand this because, um, but I think everybody's looking at each other. Uh, are you doing something about it? Uh, maybe you are doing something about it, but we have to work together and do it. Period. It, it's uh, it's, it's going to take an entire generation, a, a, a paradigm shift to really yeah. uh, bring us out of this. And I, 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 that's kind of my hope for the, the subject of, of ufology. And, and mm-hmm. if I had one hope for it in general, it's that something big will happen that snaps people out of mm-hmm. it. You know, like when COVID shut down the whole world, it caused everyone to stop for a minute for yeah. a few weeks and we really yeah. just took a, took a break. And as yes. soon as people got that break, they started to think, hey, maybe work isn't the most important thing. Maybe family's more important. Maybe I, they started to question their priorities and it was a big yes. mental shift for so many people. Yes. And I wonder if something like that or even bigger is in our future and maybe uh, maybe there is going to be a moment. I've heard rumors. I wonder if you've heard these and, and then um, I, I, we're, we're running short on time. I need to, to mm-hmm. uh, wrap it up with this, but mm-hmm. have you heard um, 
the chatter about there's supposedly going to be an announcement this year that the James Webb Space Telescope has detected signs of of life on another planet. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Have you heard anything about this? Yes. Yes. Biosignatures. Biosignatures. Yeah. Yes. Um, but on the, yeah, the thing is with NASA, um, they are behaving very strange because there was this hearing. Uh, J- uh, James Fox was there also. And uh, Bill Nelson was like, no, there's no evidence. And mm-hmm. James Fox said, but, but no, there's no evidence. And I'm like, okay. And now the DOD or uh, uh, Kirk Patrick and the error report, there's no evidence. Okay. Um, but at some point you have to come forward. Point. But they maybe they have a plan like, okay, for, at first we get let, let the people get used to biosignatures, you know, found on another planet. At least we are showing we are in control or something. And then maybe later UFOs, it, uh, non-human intelligence, I don't know, but I think they are messing it up totally, especially NASA. They are messing it up. Um, but maybe they are under restrictions. I don't know. But who is telling them what to say? That's what I find very interesting. There is this control group who is dictating what everybody can say or not. And it's a very powerful control group. And they have their tentacles all over the place. And who they are, I, don't, I have no clue. I don't know. But we don't know their names. We don't know their faces. But still, they decide everything. I think That's you uh, I mentioned earlier... Earlier in the conversation, you talked about Timothy Gallaudet, the admiral, the uh, uh, American admiral, mm-hmm. and he talked about in his, I, I'm assuming you watched his Soul Foundation presentation, did mm-hmm. you not? And he talked about uh, having, the, uh, when they would see these craft um, during training exercises, how he, and I think it was like five or six other admirals had an email chain. Do you remember this? Mm-hmm. They were they were emailing each other and they were saying, hey, "Do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? I don't know what it is. How about you? Have you do your satellites see anything?" And then one day he goes into his office and he turns on his computer and all his emails God. have been wiped from his computer yes. and everyone else's computer too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And these are yes. admirals. My job, I was the chief meteorologist of the Navy, and so all my weather guessers, meteorologists or aerographers, were on Navy ships like the USS Theodore Roosevelt forecasting weather, very critical safety of flight mission. And during that time, uh, I received a email on the Navy's secret network from my boss, the operations officer at Fleet Forces Command. He was a two-star admiral. All the ADEs were one and two-star admirals like me. I was in a support command. Others were operational, like strike group commanders, Theodore Roosevelt and others. And, uh, and the, the topic of the email was urgent safety of flight issue. And the content of the email was fairly brief. It just said, if any of you know what these are, tell me ASAP. We're having numerous near midair collisions, and we're going to have to shut the exercise down if we don't stop. And attached was the GoFast video that everyone's seen now. And uh, this was, on, and so a lot of my thought beforehand was crystallized uh, in that I knew that was not our technology because we, the U.S. government's research and development enterprise, does not test and evaluate in training ranges for the safety issues they were causing. So I, I knew immediately that was not ours. It wasn't our adversaries. I was pretty read into all of our advers- adversaries' advanced technologies, and and then I knew, and uh, and so I didn't say much, but the next day, my email was wiped from my computer and everybody else who received it. And then even worse, in terms of the reaction, uh, I would go to weekly meetings with all the people who were at ease on that email with my boss and his his operations officer, and no one ever talked about it. Yes. So someone up (laughs) higher than that, someone, someone like- Yeah, crazy. How much higher do you go? Yeah. But you know the whole the 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 entire system was reformed after Roswell. Mm-hmm. I mean, a week after the Roswell crash, they created the uh, the predecessor of the CIA, and it was renamed CIA in 18 September 47, and that's after Roswell. The Air Force was created after the Roswell crash. Also, the 18th of uh, September 47. So, the entire system was reformed. Why? Well, Roswell was the turning point because Truman back then 
of course. He didn't know what to do with it. And he was like, okay, we ha you have to reform everything because it changed the entire, uh, their worldview, you know? So they had to do something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that has any, everything to do with it. Ramsey, I, mm -hmm. I wonder, what are you looking forward to in the, the rest of 2024? Do you think there's uh, something coming around the corner? Do you see, what do you see in, in store for the subject? Well, the situation we're now in is that the non-elected, the Pentagon, are um, in essence uh, bumping against the elected. That's what we're seeing uh, see happening at this moment. And uh, Congress must take the lead now, and they are doing it with the UAP caucus. But still, they have to uh, do more because at this moment, it's still. Uh, I think they. Uh, where we will see more transparency coming, but it will be extremely difficult for the Department of Defense to finally uh, come clean, especially when you even lied within, in the error report. It's very difficult, but it's the only way forward. And I think we're, we will see uh, Congress t taking the lead more and more. And they are working behind the scenes at this moment, very hard to get it done. But it's not easy. Very, it's very difficult because you have it's a double-edged sword for them. Because imagine they are faced with uh, the, the public, the re response of the public. They are faced with because uh, the government is the government, and people see the Pentagon as as the government, and they see the Congress as the government. And but it's not one entity, mm -hmm. and that's the whole thing. They, they, so I, I, I think we will see more uh, coming from from that in the in the fu near future. Is there anything else you would like to tell the people watching or listening? What can they do to move this conversation in the right direction? Yeah, knowledge is power. So my my advice is uh, learn about the cases because that's what it's all comes down to. Um, when you know about the cases, you have knowledge, you have power. Because when people are discussing things with you, you can say, ah, no, that's not true because it went like this or like that, you know? And go back to the source. And the source is the ca are the cases. The whole circus around it, what politicians are saying, what uh, admirals are saying or whatever, uh, take it, uh, take it in, okay? Uh, but the cases is, is the core business, you know, uh, the core business. So my advice would be learn about it and also about cases in, in abroad, for instance. And um, later on, you, uh, you have a lot um, of ben you benefit from it, from this knowledge. I notice because when I well, I have a lot of case knowledge and I notice that it helps me a lot in my daily uh, engagement with, in, in the community. So that's my advice. We'll leave it there. Yes. I'm so glad that uh, <laughs> we were able to finally make this happen after going back and forth. Yeah, uh, thank too. you so much for taking the time. <laughs> thank you, man. I love your podcast. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I'll, I'll send everyone over to, to UFOB's uh, okay. YouTube channel as well. <laughs> I, always, I always send people to UFOB. That's the place to be. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know right. what? I'm, and when people don't like uh, don't like anything, talk to us because that's the whole thing. You know, uh, come to us. We're people. We're human beings. You can discuss everything. Ramsey, thank you so okay. much. I'll let you get back thank to you. it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.